Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld with RackN, and the October 15th Cloud 2030 discussion was all about the future of hiring. We spent a lot of time talking about today's hiring, and then in the end, we pulled it into what the future is going to look like. And that got us into a conversation about AI and evaluating um, employees and, and figuring out how to manage them and make them productive. So very interesting discussion. Um, stay to the end because we, we really went a long, on, a long time on this one. So enjoy it. I hope kids start thinking along those lines when they're in high school. It's like. So uh, the, the question that you and I had talked about, about doing as a, as a starting point was what career advice would you give a ninth grader um, for, right? Either yours or somebody else or a friend, right? What what would you say for that ninth grader? They should they should go. They should think about in today to for their career in twenty thirty. And if we wanted to make it IT specific, we could go into. I think most kids think, oh, when I go into IT, I want to be a programmer, and that might be the end of all. I don't think a lot of younger people who are just getting into IT understand that there's network engineers and storage engineers and uh, virtualization engineers and there's all these kind of specialties and it, it's not just software i think the hardware might the hardware i think the only hardware experience they might get is building like their gaming pcs they kind of get exposed to a little bit of networking you know with their home modem router thing but you know the whole idea of uh firewalls or load balancers there's a whole lot of other security uh, kind of need to integrate security right i thought about this kind of later yesterday you know you know where does security start getting added in i've seen security start getting added in after the network was built it's like oh by the way we should probably put a firewall in here <laughs> and it's really disruptive to build security in kind of after the fact Well, it's really we, kind of hard to build design in after the fact. There's so many networks I've seen. Well, we'll build it and then we'll document it. It's like, how does that work? You know, you don't <laughs> build a car and then like just write the user's manual after you build a car. Well, maybe they do. I don't know. But um, that's where some of the design documentation that I was going to show is like, you know, first we got to decide what we're going to build and then how do we staff to get to where we want to go. Hey, Rick, this is John. I, I don't know if this is, is this an open question or is it? Oh, no, it's open. Going? Please, please oh. jump in. Uh, so I'm John Qual. Some of you don't know me, but uh, so I spent the last four years running a coding boot camp, uh, but we also as part of the nonprofit side of it, or it, it was a nonprofit. We actually did 30,000 K through 12 kits. And so this question came up about you know, we always tell kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? And one of the things that we did is said, let's stop t asking them what do they want to do when they grow up and ask them what problems they want to be part of solving. Because 80% of all of our paychecks has to do with problem solving. And basically it's, you know, we say chase your passions, but we usually end up really, our passions end up are things that we're really good at solving and problems that we're really good at taking on. And that really changed the dynamics and so when it came to technology, because I'm, I'm actually a cloud guy that somehow found himself running a, a software boot camp. I, I couldn't, you know, I haven't written any software in at least a couple of decades. But, uh, but you know, I said, oh, you want to be in technology? Well, then why don't you find out as much about technologies as possible and what problems that they solve and see if it's a problem that you might be interested in being involved with. And that made a huge change to the kid because you know they're constantly their parents and their teachers are like what are you going to do what are you going to do what are you going to do and and they would just end up saying what they think their mom or dad or teacher wanted them to say but as soon as you said hey what problems do you want to solve in the world or what problems you want to be part of the solution they had all kinds of things to share right and some of them were pretty pretty comical i wish i could pull a couple of those out right now but but it was just it was very uh very enlightening and inspiring and um, and it's also very uh, inclusive, right? And, and how much, uh, you know, we, we would go into some really tough uh, communities and it was just open their minds that you could actually be paid really well for being really good at solving problems. 
Right. And it was just, and, it, and never in their mind did they think that they, that they could be part of solving problems in technology and, and have the, the lifestyle and the financial wherewithal that we all enjoy being in this, this industry. So there's my answer to that question. Yeah. Um, I've had the, the pleasure and the pain of, of having to deal with exactly that question with six nephews and nieces that are all just hitting the college age, just past college age. Um, and in almost every one of the cases, the, the best answer came out very much like the one you just heard, which is what is the thing that really grabs you? What's the problem that you want to solve? What do you want to, what do you want, what's interesting to you? And then let's talk about what this next generation of technologies is going to do to actually change your job. If you're a biologist, the, the way in which genomics and, and, and data analysis uh, has impacted ge genomics is, is incredible. If you're, uh, if you're interested in medicine, some, same kinds of things everything from robotics to um, various kinds of microsurgeries, so forth, and modeling as opposed to experimenting on, you know, humans or, or animals, a very big, big deal with one of my nieces. One of the big things was I, you know, I have no problem with the fact that we have to figure out how to, how to cure these diseases. But the idea of subjecting a living organism to you know, this kind of pain and suffering in order for this to, to make it better for me, I just can't deal with. And I said to her, you know, let's talk about what people are doing with simulations, with models, with artificially creation, artificial creation of, a, of an environment. And it, quite frankly, it blew her away. And she's now, you know, right this minute, visiting some pretty top flight universities and looking for programs in STEM that will take her in those kinds of directions. So, yeah. You know, some of our greatest success was going into uh, liberal arts uh, colleges and teaching them how to write software. Uh, they had this tremendous capacity for innovation and they but they didn't have the mechanism to take that their vision and make it happen and it, not that they all became software developers um, but what they said is they feel like i now have the structure and the language to take this innovation that i have and speak to a software developer and meet them halfway because i understand the difficulty of what i'm asking for i don't know if i ask for something that takes two seconds or two years but now i have i understand the scope of it the, the, the impact of what i'm asking for and i feel like i'm in a better situation so it's a lot of fun so uh, i don't know if this is um uh, directly related and i apologize i came into the conversation a couple of minutes late um but uh, I, I learned, um, I, I've, I've never actually been a real coder. I mean, the best I ever did was a little bit of basic when I was uh, taking some college classes. So I can't call myself anything approaching a coder. GW basic. Um, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and my wife had to help me with it. So, um, yeah. you know, don't, don't, uh, don't give me any credit. Um, but, uh, in line with this in, in line with solving problems and getting into it is that one of the problems that it suffers from, um, as a, as a, industry is the the whole notion of um empathy empathy in support of fellow employees empathy in support of the customers of our work etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i took a chance early on uh, when i was first promoted to a, a manager for a help desk at hp back in like 91 or something like that yes i'm that old um uh, i took a chance and hired a nurse to help me form the help desk. And we ended up hiring a couple of other people with similar backgrounds as we built out the help desk because training them on, on solving the technology problems they were facing was the easy part. But getting them to be empathetic to the situation the customer was in 
and carrying that through the life cycle of the process was the most important part. And they were fantastic at it. They just were fantastic at it. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it I mean, in, in three months, four months, we had um, an entirely different perspective from the business on, on where and how a help desk could solve problems for the company. And in fact, we got to the point where we at first dramatically increased the number of calls that came to the help desk because people thought they could actually get help. And then through the processes that we implemented, we actually drove down the number of requests that came to the help desk because people were getting trained and people were getting a better understanding of where to find help and how to use the tools and services that were available to them. So we were able to, to, uh, to grow, to solve a bigger problem and never have to grow as the company grew. Um, the size of the team stayed the same. And, um, and it started with people that weren't IT people at all. Kind of mirror that experience. I see a lot of IT like network engineers, storage engineers, or hardware engineers is probably a better term, came from help desk. And a lot of help desk people weren't necessarily technical people to start from. So it was really, it's really a different career pipeline going into the hardware side than it is into the uh, programming, into the software side. I think most software developers probably come out of college. I think a lot of hardware engineers aren't necessarily college educated. I think the ratio of college educated hardware engineers is much less than software engineers. Just, a, just my general impression. Actually, I, I, I can't resist making a comment, but I was gonna turn the floor back to you, Rich, because you had prepared some material to get us started thinking about the hiring specifically and what the workforce would look like. Um, uh, my experience has been ops, ops people are typically not classically trained in computer science, um, but that creates a um, very, very sad and disturbing um, difference. It's a it's respect, position, authority difference in organizations where ops teams are often seen as second class in, in organizations compared to the development teams. And I, it's just such a frustrating unhealthy dynamic. Um, Very much true that. Well, and, that. you know, despite the renaming of customer success, um, this is another group that as a whole is, has got to be cross-trained and trained in so many different things or supported in so many different ways. And I have absolutely seen companies live and die on the quality and the attention that's been given to their customer success. And it's not just a tech support, it's across the board. Well, thank you. Kind of interesting thoughts. I'm gonna have to think about some of these comments a lot. Um, if you want, Rob, I can go ahead and share my screen. Please do. Uh, sorry, I'm probably have to give you permission. You might, you're a presenter, so you should be able, actually, you should be able to share. Let me know if you can. You can. We're good. Okay. So can everybody see my document or anybody? Okay. A quick introduction. I've been in IT for about 25 years. I've been involved in cloud computing for 14 years beginning like 2006, that was the very beginning of cloud computing. Um, a few of the people on this call have been involved with it is that long as well. It's been an interesting 14 years or so in cloud computing. I mean, the initial discussions were, you know, cloud computing isn't real, and <laughs> starting off from that perspective. I had about eight years at IT director level with multiple public software as a service organizations. So a lot of uh, operations, uh, a lot of operations time. Um, I've had about three years of IT architecture job titles, building multiple data centers from scratch. Um, by building multiple data centers, I'm referring to designing the storage, the servers, the routers, the firewalls, the WAN circuits, everything basically from scratch. They're smaller companies. And this is what is kind of driving this discussion is that I had a really interesting 
opportunity to build data centers all by myself. And the, most people don't really have that opportunity. And I really refer to that as an opportunity um, because kind of learning how to build a cloud, a private cloud, and kind of referring to hybrid cloud as well. Um, a lot of times the different teams have kind of, kind of like conflicting um, ideas on how to build things. And once you start making um, design decisions, and it, it becomes a little difficult um, if you can't do um, design it to be a cloud from the beginning. And then of the 25 years, I spent 14 years in just uh, systems engineering, kind of just in individual silos. And part of this is uh, an idea of uh, how to get rid of technical silos. And by technical silos, I'm referring to the network engineers and the storage engineers and the server engineering team. So um, I think a lot of, I've heard a lot of discussion about get, uh, how we should get, we, that we should get rid of silos, but I haven't heard much discussion on how to get rid of silos. So a lot of this on hiring. So I'm gonna scroll through this real quick. What I'm starting off with here is this is my version of a 2030 hybrid cloud. So it's a big green box over here. This is a private cloud uh, data center module. And a private cloud portion of the hybrid would be comprised of about you know, one to six of these. And then over here, we have the public cloud components of the hybrid cloud. So I try to include basically every component of cloud computing. So it's software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, et cetera. And kind of the idea with 2030 uh, cloud computing is this top section is fluid computing management that would take all the monitoring metrics coming out of all the services and all the systems and feed it up into this uh, computing management application. And through machine learning and artificial intelligence, it would control all the parameters of all the systems down below. So it would control the, the amount of CPU and memory and storage and location and, and everything to optimize uh, cost efficiency and functional efficiency and resource efficiency. So this uh, computing management software doesn't exist yet, but I'm expecting it will exist by 2030. I know there's some companies kind of working toward this direction. Um, that's that. Uh, any questions on that or should I Chug, chug along. So this is what we're. This is what I'm proposing to try to build, and the staffing is how to get to how to get to this. I have, I have questions. I'm typing them in the notes so that we don't interrupt your flow. I, sure. I'd, I'd like to see. It, it's useful for me to see your let you think it, talk it through, and then we'll, we're collecting notes in the chat and in the notes pages. So. Okay. And part of this black box down here is the enterprise monitoring architecture that kind of um, takes all the data from all this stuff and the enterprise art monitoring architecture is what drives the data back up into the management app. This is what a data center module looks like. So this is approximately a three rack design that supports about a 750 virtual servers. But the main point of this is this is 100% designed from the very beginning before you start putting anything, any hardware into any rack. The kind of the important thing about this this diagram here is you can see there's rack units where there's space reserved for certain things. This is what I mean by 100% designed from the beginning. What we don't see now typically is there's rack space that just isn't used and it's not really assigned anything and data centers just kind of grow organically without any design at all. And it's like we'll build it and then, just, then we'll document it after it's built. So if you design it up front, you can really optimize the design. It's really basically impossible to optimize a design after it's built. And this is kind of based on a very generic compute resource requirement, um, very much in the Amazon model. Um, if you go to Amazon, you're not figuring out, you know, um, basically Amazon network is designed for everybody. It's a very generic design, so everybody can use Amazon. But there's no reason why you can't design a private cloud part of the hybrid cloud to be very generic. that will support everything just the way Amazon does. So I'll kind of chug through this. This kind of says why hybrid cloud. This is why I think hybrid cloud is so important going into 2030. It's just the staff dense. Basically, it's cost efficiency is number one because a lot of people have reasons why we should go to cloud computing or hybrid cloud. But every company I've ever been at, management only cares about cost efficiency or cost number one. Uh, it, they don't care if it's 
uh, more efficient as far as management. They don't really care about disaster recovery cost. All they care about is, you know, the bottom line, how much dollars is going out. But us as engineers, we care very deeply about functional density and resource density, integrated RAID, um, integrated DR right into the design. So many, every company I've been at is like, we'll build it and then we'll figure out disaster recovery later. And of course that never gets done because no management is ever gonna approve 100% redundancy cost. So going to a RAID 5 disaster recovery cuts the redundancy cost or DR cost to 16% as opposed to 100%. So now we'll get into like where the staffing comes in. So what got me thinking about this was Mark Teeley and Ben Haynes discussion on the edge, um, Edgecast um, Nirvana, um, I'm blanking on the podcast, but Mark Teeley's podcast, Edgevana. And Ben Haynes was saying as a CIO, the most important thing was developing a team. And that got me thinking, it's like, well, if we want to develop a team for 2030, what would that team look like? And kind of the, my opinion over the last six months has become incredibly interesting to me is emotional intelligence and how emotional intelligence and empathy, as Mark stated, is so important. And one of the books I, one of the first books I read on this was on emotional intelligence, uh, IT leadership by Harvard Business Review. And one, in the first couple of pages of this book, it says mm, intellect and IQ and intelligence um, compared to emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence is provide is twice as good as the, the other two without emotional intelligence, you know, intelligence and IQ. Um, without empathy, it's not going to go as far. It's like twice as important to have emotional intelligence. Um, it, and John, if you'd like to talk to John Qualls, if you'd like to talk about this a little bit, and then I, this is a very coincidence. Once I heard that Ben Haynes uh, talk and Mark Teeley's talk, um, I just coincidentally started talking with John Qualls and asked him what he was working on, and he was working on uh, kind of a hiring and talent management based on some emotional intelligence as well. So a very interesting service. But John, if you want to take over from here, if you wouldn't mind, uh, talk sure. a little bit about Head, Heart, and Briefcase. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, John Qualls uh, built a few data centers, started a company called Blue Lock. Uh, sorry, I'm a little off maybe the night because I was actually with my founders. We just cashed our uh, earnout check. So it was, a, it was a nice night last night with Blanton's. <laughs> and uh, But uh, started that in 2006. Um, had kind of eight employees. We went from eight employees, one data center to five data centers and 300 employees in six months. And I tell you, it almost killed me. And it, it was the, it really was the people side of it that I, I, I candidly was just under, under prepared for taking it on. And uh, so uh, did that, spent the last uh, four years running a nonprofit coding boot camp, And uh, I really thought I was closing the skills gap but I really learned it was about this purpose gap. And I started really going back and saying, who are the best engineers I ever had? And as I think I said this to you, Rick, is sometimes my best engineers were not the smartest ones, right? I had some people who are just incredibly smart and talented, and they, they brought a tremendous amount of skills and experience to the role, um, but they were almost unemployable and, uh, and really difficult to, to get to work with others. So this concept of really hiring and, and uh, man, I wish I had this 10 years ago, but this concept of you have to hire for the head, the heart and the briefcase. We end up hiring for skills and experience and then we end up firing for personality conflict, emotional intelligence. And we also, they get slammed. You know, I have to say, I've seen so many engineers with their, I can just visualize this, their face, you know, pushed up against this glass ceiling um, because it's, it's no longer about what skills they can bring to the table, but their ability to actually lead others to solve big problems that are bigger than just one person. And a lot of times that comes around emotional intelligence. So the head, heart, and briefcase, head to us is what are the behavioral expectations for the role? Um, and then what are the, you know, the aptitude I like to call the cognitive potential? I want to be very clear. I'm not I'm not trying to measure how smart they are. How smart you are is how big, you guys got these big, huge sponges, right? That's how, that's how smart you are. Well, I'm more interested in measuring the absorption rate of your sponge. 
because you know all of us we're, we're in this space that just moves so quickly and your ability to pick up new stuff quickly and be able to absorb it and take it in and and execute it is is paramount right so the head and then i was talking to rick about the behavioral expectations and someone says go hire an engineer well, well what kind of engineer is this a, a an engineer that's customer facing is bad you know i like to think of front yard dog backyard dog um you know, there's so much more than just the word engineer. So that's the head part. On the heart side, it really is, you know, to me, the head part is where their DNA is, right? How their, you know, their behavioral profile and how it goes to the role. But the heart is where that on the emotional intelligence journey. And how can we tell where they are? And how can we lead them to the next place and make them aware of what it is? I think when I first joined, Rob, I think I heard you talking about, I think it was Strength Finders, but I don't think you said Strength Finders. I think you said something else. Uh, it is Strength Finders. Yeah, I call yeah. them Strength Builders, but yeah, yeah. I meant Strength Finders. Yeah. All, all good. Uh, you know, I, I like assessments. Uh, I always define them as this. The assessment is a scientific shortcut and framework to the insight to the problem we're trying to uncover. And the most important part is the problem we're trying to uncover or try to understand, not the assessment. Uh, too often people, and Rob, I think you said this, it gets weaponized, right? People feel judged and, you know, it, it, and they, they oversell these things as, you know, they'll solve uh, diarrhea and depression and acne and, and all your problems. And, and uh, it's just, you know, they're just a tool. It's like arguing about the difference between a DeWalt and some other kind of a hammer. I'm sorry about this, but this is my, I got to be a way to turn that off. There we go. So, head heart and briefcase is really now let's hire harder so that we can manage easier and if we if an individual i'll kind of finish with this to me i think we all have been looking for our purpose in life and what those things are and i've always felt like there's just five questions that i have to answer the first one is who i am and the more comfortable i am in my skin the more confident i am the second thing is who am i not this is where you know, to me, some of my greatest successes have been the things I've said no to, not what I say yes. Yes is easy. I say, you know, you say yes, and you fill your life full of obligations and no commitments. So that's the second question. Third question is, how do you work with others? This is the, to me, the been the biggest cha challenge with engineers is getting them to work together and empathy. And you know who you care about? You care about people who understand who you are. And the more you understand who you are, then you can use that framework to understand who they are. Fourth question is, what do you do? What is that unique ability you bring? And then the fifth question is, why do you do it? So who are you? When do you say no? How do you work with others? What do you do and why do you do it? To me, that is the, uh, you know, when I really started to approach that in, in building engineers and, and uh, it's just been humbling to watch, uh, watch them run uh, with that. So. That's where I think things are going in, in the future. It's, it's going to be more than the skills that you bring to the table, but it's the whole package, the head, the heart, and the briefcase. And what are you doing to invest in it in a lifelong journey? So how's that, Rick? Great. Um, John gave me a quick demo of the Purpose HQ service that he's developed. And one of the most interesting things I thought about it was it monitors kind of emotional intelligence over time and gives feedback on how to improve that. So, you know, we can go and give skills training all day long, but this is the first I've ever seen of kind of monitoring and improving emotional intelligence over time. Yeah. Hey, Rick, so. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to join today. I'm sorry. Uh, for all, I did have a hard stop at 1130. I have an interview I got to jump on. Uh, <laughs> but, but I, man, I just love what you guys are doing. Where was this stuff at 10 years ago when I felt so alone and it wasn't surrounded? Wow. I met Rick and, and uh, I, I just love what you guys are doing. If I'd, I'd love to hear more about what you're doing and everything else and, and be a part of, of the vision of what you think about you're doing. So you're welcome. Thank you. Thank back. you everyone. Rick has the ability to reach out to me. Be well, have a great thank day. You. Yeah. Uh, kind of the reason I'm so interested in emotional intelligence and the, um, the improvement on over time and the, uh, is that engineers generally turn into management. And if you don't have good emotional intelligence as an engineer, we're not gonna have a good emotional intelligence as a management. And if we don't have good intelligence, emotional intelligence as a manager, we're never going to get to cloud 2030. We're gonna continue 
do, continue to keep doing the things we always have been. So that's why I feel this is so critical. Uh, I, I concur on that. It's a major thing, linking back to other conversations, we've talked about diversity in the past. Um, and basically, in terms of getting diversity, in terms of race, gender, whatever you want to look at, most programs, corporate, whatever, are very have been successful in terms of getting engineers to go into STEM industries at the at the basic level. They have not been able to get them past the entry level to management, and that empathy is is part of it. And there's other and mentoring and other things. So basically, it's the next step. It's not just giving people the basic skills, teaching them how to code, for example, teaching, right. giving them a certification. It's the next step, these soft skills and the intangibles. That's really the, the barrier to promotions, which is um, sometimes not what we necessarily think about, but it's uh, basically the, in terms of the differentiation between getting ahead in life, that's Hmm. Interesting. I'm, I'm thinking through a couple of weeks ago, we did a, um, a DevOps lunch with um, one of the people who does boot camps for vets. Um, and that was one of the selling points uh, for, for him is that the vets, the veterans show up because they've been military trained like with a great can do attitude at the same time, they're, they're, they're very focused on give me a, you know, give me a task, do it. And so he has to tweak these, these skills. I guess I, oops, I want to make sure I'm not missing somebody. I have, I have a question, I guess, about how, does this mean that in, as we go forward in the future hiring process, are we going to be metricing people on, on these, you know, non-technical skills. Like, are we going to like ingest people based on AI metrics and personality tests like we were talking about before? Yes. Yes. Uh, there's going to be controls to prevent certain bad uh, biases from happening, but you have to. It's it's necessary. I've, I've heard this mentioned and read this a number of times. It's like the uh, no jerks allowed. It's like we hire for no jerks. Um, I'll have to give us some thought. I'll have to look this up. It was a book on software development. But basically, the, the, there's always one software developer who locks himself in a room and won't talk to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And they become kind of like the sticking point. And you can't get rid of him because he like owns this critical part of the code. But there was a name for it. It's like the, I have to think of it, but there's a specific name for it. It was a Microsoft uh, development manager who came up with a term for it. This might be ringing a few bells because it was kind of a yeah. famous talk, you know, circa the late 90s. <laughs> well, they, a lot of times they would call that person that, well, prima donna is what, maybe what you're thinking. Yes, prima donna is a good word for it. And to diversity, I'd like to speak to that a little bit. I think the hiring process is broken. I think the annual review process is completely broken, uh, maybe in IT more than anywhere else. I think the hiring process is really driven more towards um, knowledge and kind of knowledge, like almost like uh, trivia questions type of interviews on technical questions. And that comes from maybe you know tr uh, classical training um, I've had very good success in interviewing and hiring based on aptitude, much more so than what their current knowledge was. Because I, my, my belief is if they have the aptitude to learn, I can teach them anything. But if they, if they don't have the aptitude, I don't care. They're not, not going to learn anything new or not as so, much as fast as they want to teach them. So how is that broken? It seems to work for you. Oh, because I based because I based uh, my hiring on aptitude, and 
uh, it's very a discussion based interview process. So when but I why, why, why do you think that other people don't do that? Based on the dozens and dozens of interviews that I've been on <laughs> and, and, and um, anecdotes that I've heard from hundreds of other people. I've never heard almost anything different. Uh, because I have, what I get generally gather is that the, the testing is a way to screen people. That's the way that a lot, that if you have a hundred applications, you start using tests as screens. Right, right. But it's kind of so, like if you speak to diversity in just a second, I don't know if this maps, but there's a lot of there's a lot of like discussion or has been about like the SAT tests are very gender or you know are racially biased. So if you have questions if the SAT can be biased, then why can't uh, IT screening be biased as well? Right. I, if it's okay though, can we back up to the prima donna just for a moment? Sure. Because one of the things that 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 keeps being said is diversity and and excluding the personality type that is the prima donna is reducing your diversity. There is a place, there's a reason that anecdotally that personality type has the important part of the code. It's because they are hyper-focused on a specific part of the, um, of the problem. And so I, I, I want to just have a discussion around maybe it's not that hiring them or or firing them or keeping them or, or getting rid of them is is the problem. The problem is that they're not being managed correctly and yes. they're not being um, there. We have to manage everyone from where they are and help move them to where we need them to be. Very much so. Exactly. If you're a prima donna, you have to be able to recognize that and you have to be able to uh, let people help you out and that's but, uh you yeah. have to be uh, self-aware enough to be able to let, to let you to let that but, happen but you mm -hmm. can't be aware unless somebody has taught you how to do that which means there has to be a manager or someone that is an authority figure or an educational figure that they respect that actually has the tool set to bring them to awareness. And so that's a much more emotional level type manager. Mm -hmm. uh, testing in AI testing for emotional intelligence is just a giant lose. You've got to actually have management and you actually have to have team members who know how to identify the emotional intelligence of these players and okay. know whether the manager on the team is going to be able to grow them to where they need to be to make the team effective. And just right. think about this in terms of the larger thing. Mark Zuckerberg, let's call him a prima donna. And I forgot the guy's name. The guy, Eric, that was from uh, Google, who was the chairman. Basically, had, I'm, not, I'm just trying to think of, just think about a prima donna that has a grown up supervising him. Right. Every so Don Quixote all... needs a Sancho. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, and... there, there are times when it's better to hire pairs or, or, or not hire because you, you, you never really hire pairs. But if I'm building a team, there, there, there's certainly in the past been pairs of people that I wanted to have together on the team yes. because their, their synergy is such that they, they help complete the other person as, as a team member. I'd agree with that very much so. If you think about Rob and his partner, Greg, you guys complete each other. Like Greg doesn't, <laughs> no, but he doesn't speak until like he really has something to say. And we really have to like pull it out. You know, so I, they do complete each other. I, well, it's, this is, uh, Greg and I have been working together over multiple jobs and multiple decades now. And, and one of the things that, that I've learned, but this doesn't just apply to Greg. And I, I think this is the extrovert, introvert, part of the value of having some of these um, you know, uh, sociology testing infrastructures that you can say, somebody who doesn't, doesn't 
jump into a conversation and, and make their point and push everybody out still has valid points. Um, and this to me, Mike, you had this comment about the, the go get a beer test with somebody. You might have somebody incredibly introverted who doesn't want to have, you know, a personal, personal detail, just shows up at work, is very heads down, doesn't share a lot of details, that is an amazingly great contributor. Um, but you have to create a space for them to make their comment, right? Andrea's talking about Greg, you know, I've been in situations where I'm like, everybody just shut the hell up. We've got to have some other people who aren't speaking talk and give their opinions. And, and just because you're not saying something in a meeting doesn't mean you, you don't have really important thoughts for the meeting. Um, and that's all, that's all of our responsibilities. But I do, I do feel like we have these, these challenges where it's really easy to filter out somebody who doesn't think like you um, or act like you or talk like you or is abled like you um, and make, make really bad assumptions. And it, it scares me. Um, and I'm not saying Rackin is a, is a great example of this. I, I think that we have to think about what it takes to have that type of broader, those broader disciplines and get people in uh, to organizations and make a place for them. I think that's what a, a really good manager does is kind of understand the personalities of the team members. So I think that's where the Purpose HQ service does a pretty uh, um, exceptional job at that. It, it just kind of generates a report of like you can compare two people and it generates a report of how well they can work together. And it kind of identifies one as an introvert, one as an extrovert and what each one needs to work better together. Um, I, just as a maybe a last point on that and we'll continue a little bit is I would really like to see emotional intelligence referred to during like annual reviews. You know, it's like, it's one thing to, I think emotional intelligence can be improved, but you have to be aware of that you need improvement. I took the personality test. Um, I was pretty interesting how it came out as like kind of scary accurate, but it did kind of point out to me that uh, I have a, a significant area of improvement that I need to work on. So I was, I was pretty happy I took the test because I, I agreed with the, with, the, with the assessment. That's an interesting. So having tools that help people review and analyze would definitely be helpful. Rick, I'm going to pull down your screen if that's, a, if that's okay, because that'll let us sure. move back to the video grid. Oh, sure. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can you do it? Can Actually, you stop the share? I, Rick, Rick's on a, a, a good track oh, there. I and just the, did it. Um, especially for areas where engineers, or, uh, which tend to make up a large portion of uh, cloud 2020 and companies and whatnot, we need tools to help us in our areas of weakness. And we need tools to help us identify those areas of weakness. And uh, management certainly needs to know, needs to have those tools and have ways of, um, providing like educational uh, material so that those people interested in growing themselves can possibly do it on their own. I would also want to add that we need to foster an environment where showing a weakness or admitting that you have a weakness is not a ground for fear. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, very much so. That's, I, this is, this to me is the dilemma with 2030 is we're so focused on STEM education, you know, boot camps, skills, things like that. And yet, if what we're saying as a group is true, the number one thing that you're going to have to be able to do is, you know, be empathetic. But I feel like this is, this is known, you know, like we know we have to help people actually connect through these digital mediums and not hide behind code commits and, and things like that. Are we going to have tools that actually help people with it? Right now, the tools that we've got are making it worse, not better. Wow, that's a statement. That's <laughs> tools that make things worse. That's interesting. Well, that's because uh, when you're looking for any tool, uh, a jackhammer looks like 
a tool if that's the only one that's in that type of uh, area. It's like you're looking for a hammer and all they have is jackhammers. You go for a lot of people go for the jackhammers. I mean, Google is 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 an example case out the wazoo where they don't seem to train their managers. They don't have tools for emotional intelligence. And you talk to people who work at Google, an awful lot of them are unhappy for reasons they can't especially can't really identify other than the team's not working well. I'm just thinking for a moment. Um, yeah, I think the on emotional intelligence book, it's got about um, 12 different uh, scenarios coming from different businesses on how teams are, are either working very well together or not working very well together. And to me, the not working well together is the, the more interesting ones and how they were, how the teams were improved or not improved. So just uh, can't really recommend that book enough. <laughs> The anachron and the theory of uh, team dynamics is that the well every 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 team every team every team that works well only works well in one way, but there's a million ways to have a team dysfunction. <laughs> as, as, that's that's the reference. But sorry. Well, I, I think they're team personalities, just like there are individual personalities. So it's really yeah. interesting to me to kind of map a team personality as a unique identity. I, the, the thing that I'm getting back to when I think about 2030 in the future and plot a line with AIs and integrations with that, I mean, you could be in a team in 10 years where one or more AIs is actually a, a, a component of that team. As a matter of fact, the manager of that team might actually be an AI from that perspective, or predominantly an AI with a human with some type of human augmentation, do, do people think right? Is what one is Rob crazy? <laughs> two, two, would that be better? Assuming like we could fix some of the bias problems in AI. I think those uh, are two different questions. Okay. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't say better. I would say different. Um, and and the people that are functioning well in today's marketplace might not function as well in the marketplace that you're envisioning because you have to you can work a, a personal uh, you can work a manager that's a person in different ways or you have to work a manager that's a person in different ways than you would an ai and and there are people that succeed a lot because they know how to work their manager. <laughs> no, I Sorry, mean, I'm laughing. Just, I've, I, I spent enough time in big organizations to be, yeah. uh, oh God, yes. You know? It's funny to me to see how different teams, and, and I think this is culture more than anything, but for instance, at Molecula, where our CEO is very peppy, even the most basic news ends in five exclamation points. Like everything is like so exciting. <laughs> and that racket, like I like it's like with my husband Walter, everything's fine. The most amazing news is fine. Like, so it's just different cultures of companies, there's, you know. There's definitely different. I but I but so I could see I, I guess I'm I'm I keep trying to put on the 2030 hat and everything we're describing, if there's if there's real material value. In, in EQ and team harmony and team dynamics, then y'all have convinced me that there is no doubt we are gonna throw AI and analytics into this problem in such a way that somebody's like, oh, there are social media posts or seeing a little depressed or angry, or maybe I should, you know, send them some information that helps them feel better, or, you know, we're already, right? This is where my head's exploding. We are already doing social media um, companies that are manipulating your emotional states to sell more advertising, right? That that that's not a that is a known that's not a opinion. That's a fact at this point. Are we? Is our hiring systems going to look like that? That would be sad if they do, because they're 
a lot of people who aren't manipulated by those companies and the people who aren't susceptible to that manipulation, at least some of them, are going to be really important going forward. Some of the uh, most neuro the neurodiverse people are oftentimes the ones who make the difference between success and failure in small companies. Yeah, there's also has the opportunity to become rather dystopian. And uh, <laughs> like from, from our perspective, we're measuring these tools as, as being geared towards pushing for equality or equity. Uh, but I can also see just a company want, tweaking the algorithms just to, to, to aim for, for say, to, to, to hire uh, people who they know they're, or that they, they're going to guess uh, will have lower maintenance, which is going to start excluding a whole swath of people who would otherwise be exceptional given the chance. So a, a thing about, uh, and I don't know how this responds to your initial um, question, Rich, uh, sorry, Rich, um, Rob, about uh, the AI. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, first of all, uh, you know, teams in general, um, you know, if, if you go into an interview and you say, I'm a good teams person, then you're immediately discounted as, oh, everybody's a good teams person. And yet when you get hired, well, why isn't he a good teams person? <laughs> well, I didn't say I was a good teams person during my interview, did I? Um, and so there's this, there's this, uh, pardon my frankness, there's this bullshit that happens between how we hire and how we cliche someone who's being hired that's incredibly important to what we actually say to that person verbally and non-verbally when we hire them. Um, and so I think that's got to be a critical component of the thought process of bringing people on board. The, 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 the process of having them on board has to be an incredibly well thought out function. And in fact, it's odd that I was literally just speaking about this with a couple of other very important people in my life right now. Um, so the process of bringing people on board, how they're trained, how they're brought up to the culture, et cetera, is hugely critical in their success. Secondarily, teams never fail. Teams don't fail. I'll take that argument all day long. Teams don't fail. Leadership fails. Mathematic. I'm not even, I'm not a math whiz. I'm not nearly as smart as most of the people on this call right now, but I can tell you mathematically a team of more than three people failing as a team is, is so mathematically a long shot as compared to the leader being the problem. And once you go above three, it, it, the math just gets worse and worse in favor of it being the leader that's the problem. So when we talk about you know, what kind of culture we want, when we talk about how we deal with individuals in a team, I've had teams where every single one of my direct reports, all senior managers and directors, every single one of them, the, the vast majority of them, I should say, would never go out to have a beer together. They wouldn't, they, they're just not the same people. But creating a common vision and, and helping people fit to where they add the most value and helping people feel valued when they're contributing to the team makes them believe that they are a team, makes them believe that they can contribute more as a team. And so my biggest concern, that long story cut short, my biggest concern about using AI or using what we all see in the news and in the press and in books all the time of anything that says, it's always this, it's always this, you need to be this, that's wrong every single time, that's just wrong. And so um, uh, the, the human equation of dealing with teams and developing people, um, making them feel excited about what they're doing and contributing more than they thought they could contribute, um, uh, is, is potentially a science and maybe AI will solve for that someday. Um, but realistically, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really delicate path and the best leaders um, know how to do that. They know how to do that without fear uh, and they know how to do that regardless of whether they have you know, a prima donna and, um, uh, and 10 really empathetic people uh, or some other mix. But you do have to make a call 
at some point about the value of that prima donna versus the value of the team as a whole and how much are they contributing and how much will how much time are you willing to spend in firewalling their behavior from the rest of the team because of the greater value versus just saying fuck it i i've, I've got to cut my losses and find someone who's uh, more able to contribute while still not burning the team to the ground but Mark, so I agree with, with your point about the the role of the leader and making changes in the team. The part that I question is, I, I wonder if AI is, if AI really kind of plays a role here because, or if it does, we have to think very differently about how we use technology into this mix. Because as you mentioned um, in your examples, there's a conscious uh, rationalization that takes place in the human psyche to say, you know what, this is not the outcome that I ultimately wanted. What can I do to change it? But yet, if you think about some of the, the ways that we build models and kind of the inherent way that AI functions, it's based on past history, squarely based on past history. So we have to either figure out a way to infuse or identify behaviors or outcomes that we don't want is a way to guide AI, or we have to come up with a completely different way to do it. I, I, in some ways, I, I think a lot of folks, not the folks on this call and not this conversation, but a lot of folks are kind of using AI in a way that I don't think it should, be, it should ever be used. And so bias comes into, the, into play and not surprisingly, right? Because it's based on history and we're all biased in some way. Yeah, so no, I don't know what the answer is, but it's, I think it's something that has to be kind of figured out. The, the other thing that, that occurs to me in this conversation, right? So again, the complex systems thinking guy throwing his two cents in here um, is I can't think of a place in nature where a system actually truly optimizes, like optimizes like an engineer would optimize that portion of the system, right? What nature does is it gets to pretty damn good given the, the environment it has, but it also creates new and destroys what doesn't work on a regular basis. So the idea that you could create a stable environment, an optimized environment without um, having to play with the dynamics constantly the way a good leader would do right the way that leadership is intended to do to me just seems really foreign the in hiring can you do a better job i mean there's a lot of experimentation around that right now with maybe AI, ai helping out with hiring and, and identifying the people that really do have that little thing you don't know the thing i'm excited about is is the experiment you know, I can't talk a lot about this, but the experiment that we were running at AWS and sort of which a number of learning companies are doing, not just uh, what we were doing in um, trying to say, what if we made the, the person the center of skills assessment instead of the institutions? And so that if we collected all your information about everything you did that built skill and built experience and built uh, reputation, potential, right? And brought that together into an identity for the individual. And then that you evaluate, you know, a, a common set of that data that um, has been collected. Could you get a much better assessment of who actually has the temperament and the skills, certainly the skills, maybe even the temperament and the skills to take on a specific task or a specific role? Um, that to me is somewhat exciting because at least what you're doing is you're creating a common playing field that if some, you know, if somebody working in a mechanic shop someplace or working uh, on a farm or working, you know, in a, as an aide to a Supreme Court justice does certain things and you're looking for tasks, if, if they show the right set of capability, that's going to come through a little bit better potentially. I, I don't see much AI in there except maybe in an evaluating that data um, once you have massive amounts of it. But um, I, I'm much more interested in, in having a, a really, you know, in observability in this space than I am AI, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. AI, <laughs> no uh, I think folks are getting ahead on AI. Uh, the, the model for learning 
is a self-limiting one where, and uh, someone else spoke on that earlier and that it only has the history and we're actually putting all of our biases into it. So the closer we get to AI that is focused on the soft skills, the worst the, worst the bias is gonna get. I mean, right now they're actually talking, uh, a lot of the AI world is talking about literally phrenology at this point. And we have to tamp that down because phrenology is a, a way to assess pers a person's goodness or badness or wow. capability to that is just, yeah. And so it's, it's not AI in the sense of the original intent of the field. And what we need, what we're talking about needing is something much closer to a self-learning and AI. And even that, um, the folks who have been in the field since the beginning are saying that's 30 years off, if, if that close. Um, I put a link into David Henkel Wallace. He is an amazing person to follow. He's been in this since the very beginning as a student of Minsky at 14. Um, would, would he come to speak to us? Maybe part of the um, discussion? We might be able to get him. I can actually ping him on that. Uh, I'm not Please. directly his friend, but I've talked to him and we're uh, alums. Um, <laughs> And actually, that might be a that would be really useful for this group to really understand where AI is. Uh, this is the second, at least the second wave where everybody's talking AI, and the first one was like expert systems and knowledge acquisition things like that. And this is the next hype wave. It's going to go down because everything AI is it generates all these wonderful tools. But so far, and we're getting closer, but so far, it still st is off in the horizon 30 years and has been for the past 50 years. <laughs> so the horizon's always 30 years off. <laughs> <laughs> A quick point, um, the cloud roles and responsibilities of cloud admin, cloud engineer, and uh, cloud architect are in the document that'll be you know, available as a resource. We didn't really have time to get into that too much. On the second part about AI, I think at this point, the input for AI for hiring are resumes. And I don't see how resumes, or how AI is going to interpret emotional intelligence based on the input of resumes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, think of all the gaming we're going to be doing for AI resume reading. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. You went to where I was going. Everybody, this is amazing. I love these conversations where Nobody wants to stop, but but we do yet need to stop. <laughs> Richard, so, Rick, you're thank amazing. you for <laughs> for feeding this. this Valentin, conversation. do you have a second? Can I pin you directly, Valentin? Val, yeah. Yes, yes, I'd love to. Okay, I'm going to pin you. I wanted to ask about Chain Kit. <laughs> okay. Okay. Talk to you later, cool. everyone. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Right. Thanks.